Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today on the latest ECA Learning Zone webinar, all about the decarbonisation of buildings. On our panel today, we have Nigel Thomas, Specification and Projects Manager at ABB UK. We also have Richard Quilter, Specification Area Manager at ABB UK, and they are joined by ECA's very own Luke Osborne, uh, ECA Senior, um, pardon me, Energy Solutions Advisor. Today's session will include an overview of the drive to net zero, the decarbonisation of buildings, and hopefully you'll come away with a deeper understanding of energy measurement ver verification analysis as well. I'll shortly hand over to Luke to kick off the session, but before I do that, I'd uh, just like to remind you that you can use the questions box on your screen at any time during today's presentation. There will be uh, two or three pauses, I believe, within the presentation to uh, pause for questions. Um, we'll also answer questions at the end of the session. Lastly, from me, uh, today's session will be recorded and a full replay will be available on ECA's YouTube channel, and that's at youtube.com forward slash ECA live. And uh, be sure to also check out our wide range of videos and previous webinar replays from the ECA Learning Zone series covering all manner of technical and business topics. Uh, with that said, I hope you enjoy today's session. Over to you, Luke. Thank you very much, Omar. Uh, yes, welcome everybody. And uh, normally I would do a couple of slides at this point and a brief introduction. Um, but what you have ahead is an all encompassing presentation. And this does cover everything you need to know uh, from how energy is generated and used, the reasons for change, how, elect how electrical systems can be improved and made more efficient and much more besides. Um, after all, electricity and its systems and the increased electrification of the world around us, they are major part, uh, there it's a major part of how we're going to achieve our net zero carbon targets. So this presentation will both test and expand your knowledge in this area. Uh, there are many aspects that the electrotechnical contractor can influence through a range of services. From the obvious, such as installing renewable energy, generation and storage, uh, installing electric vehicle charge points, efficient lighting, etc., uh, and through to addressing power quality and allowing customers to monitor the various points of energy usage, uh, even allowing AI to do the heavy lifting. So without further ado, uh, and without giving too much away, I'll hand you over to Nigel Thomas and Richard Quilter for what will be a very informative presentation. Over to you guys. Okay, thank you very much, Luke. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Nigel Thomas. Uh, I'm going to do the first part of the presentation. Uh, so I'm the National Specification and Projects Manager for ABB Electrification UK. Uh, and, and Richard is uh, is part of my team uh, and he's, uh, he looks after predominantly the London area. So, uh, But uh, please feel free to ask any questions as we go through. And the, but there is also designated pausing spaces through the presentation uh, in which we can take uh, take questions. Right, so I will begin. Okay, a little bit about ABB. Uh, ABB's vision is to electrify a smart, safe and sustainable world uh, and to reach a 2030 carbon neutrality in all our operations. So ABB as an organisation are, are very keen and very proactive in decarbonising our operations from our manufacturing plants and sales offices and everything to do and also to provide the technologies and solutions to help uh, you guys as uh, installers designers and engineers uh, and uh, manufacturing to, to create a net zero world okay the learning objectives through this cpd <clears throat> is uh, look and appreciation of how energy is used uh, an understanding of the factors driving net zero and uh, the subsequent developments in energy management and verification technologies uh, and also a brief view on, on digital twins and our digital twin solutions are contributing towards future design strategies. Quick overview of the agenda, how energy is used today, urbanisation, digitisation, sustainability energy efficiency standards, technical memorandum, guides and certification, drive to net zero, energy measurement and, sorry, energy management and analysis, uh, and what is a digital twin, and how to achieve this through ABB ability. 
First off, we'll look at uh, our energies used today. And the first is a little quiz. Um, yeah, you can do this interactively, but we're not doing it today. So if you just have a think, I mean, what do you think the percentage of total energy is wasted during conversion, transportation, and processing? Um, is it 30%? No. Is it 40? No. Is it 50? No. It's in fact 60% of energy is wasted. And so, quick look at the complicated um, landscape in which we're uh, currently operating in with a mix of uh, carbon based fuels, biomass, renewables. Uh, and so, very complicated system. Uh, and there's, especially in the traditional uh, energy generation systems, not that efficient. And say so circa 60% of energy is wasted, 40% uh, of energy is wasted as heat for conversion of electricity to heat, and 62% of losses during that conversion. I say so it's a very complicated landscape, and I believe this is going to, going to get more complicated as we move towards more sustainable uh, energy sources, and we'll have multi multiple sources servicing a, a facility or a building. Second question, uh, what is the typical amount of carbon that is embodied within a construction product? Um, I mean, I don't know whether people pay much attention to this or whether you've been asked, but 10%, no, it's in fact 30% of carbon is embodied within construction products. And this just uh, a little uh, diagram, this is out of the uh, CIPC TM38 renewable energy sources for buildings uh, and it just demonstrates that 40 percent of all energy is used within the built environment 45 percent of co2 and greenhouse gases and just for um, a point that when most people talk about zero carbon that includes greenhouse gases as well so so it's not only co2 it's all greenhouse gases so sf6 and other refrigerants uh, are created 30% of this carbon is embodied emissions in construction products, and 70% of carbon is created from the operational use of a building. So what is embodied carbon? Embodied carbon is the carbon or greenhouse gases emitted or created during the extraction of the raw materials, the transport of those materials to the factory, the actual manufacturing process itself, transportation from that through the distribution channel or direct to site, construction, and then you have another part which is actual life use of the uh, the system or the building or the product. And then, then you look at the demolishing, decommissioning, taking it away, putting it to landfill or recycling. So all that lot equates to 30% of the total whole life carbon that's within a product. So a lot of the people talk about the operational carbon, but there's a lot to look at from an embodied carbon point of view as well. Uh, and this is a very interesting graph. As I said, you've got 70-30 split. Over time, that 70-30 is going to change. Uh, we're becoming more efficient. We're generating and using energy more efficiently. So the actual operational carbon is going to diminish over time. But the embodied carbon is going to stay remotely static and will become the dominant source of emissions. Uh, and I'd like to use an example here uh, with an electric vehicle. Um, uh, they mentioned earlier about uh, EV chargers. ABB are a leading manufacturer of electric uh, vehicle chargers, so especially fast chargers. Um, but electric vehicle, great um, idea to, to reduce carbon and um, cleaner air but is electric vehicle really net zero providing you replenish your vehicle's electricity in the battery and you charge it up with sustainable uh, electricity yeah your your operational carbon for that vehicle is going to be uh, net zero but the actual manufacture of that vehicle currently is very similar to that of a combustion engine vehicle and there are figures saying that uh, that you need to drive your new electric vehicle for at least 50 to 60,000 miles using sustainably sourced or renewable energy supplies to offset the carbon created during its manufacture. So 
so that's the sort of balancing hat that you need to think about when you, you're looking at the construction and the materials used in it. As I say, it might be uh, an effort operationally low carbon, but is it really zero carbon? Uh, again, put things into context. Embodied carbon per element, as I say, predominantly this is looking at buildings. You know, obviously the superstructure and substructure where you've got lots of steel, lots of concrete, lots of bricks, very uh, energy intensive to manufacture. That's where all your, your big chunks of car embodied carbon are going to be. Uh, to, on a typical size, medium sized building, the MEP system accounts for around 4% of embodied carbon within a building. Okay. Our energy is used today, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with the building regulations at Partel, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in a couple of slides. Uh, but it details metering requirements uh, and, and what loads need to be measured and what needs to be monitored. Uh, for example, distribution boards over 50 kilowatt need to be independently measured, uh, and mechanical loads between 10 and 50 kilowatts. And then you have unmonitored small power. Interesting to note that in a commercial building, 36% of operational energy is used in unidentified and unmetered applications. And the same with residential buildings, slightly less at 23%. But this is you know, sort of between a quarter and just over a third of energy is, we don't know what it's being used for. We don't know, how come, and if you don't know what it's being used for and you can't see it, how can you measure it? And how can you optimize it or see if it's being wasted? So just complying to the minimum standards in part L, are we really doing all we can to optimize our energy usage? Another big factor, urbanization, digitization, sustainability. Okay, there are five key mega trends happening in the globe at the moment. There's a shift in global economic power. Demographic shift, uh, 20, 30, the world's population is projected to rise by more than a billion. Accelerating urbanization, rise of technology and climate change and resource scarcity. For the purpose of this presentation, I'm just gonna look at the, the last three. Okay, another little quiz, um, okay. How many people do you think are added to the urban population each week? Is it 150,000, 400,000, 500,000? No, it's one and a half million people. One and a half million people are added to the urban population every week. And staggeringly enough, as I say, 90% of this urban population growth is in the African and Asian subcontinents. Uh, this is changing the way we live and the demands on our infrastructure, services, and job, and the climate and environment. Uh, if you look at the UK, estimated population of London is 8.7 billion and 13% of the UK population. And 81% of people in the UK will be living in urban areas. And over 65, and the over 65s, will represent a 20th of the population by 2030. So it's a, quite some staggering statistics which are going to modify and change the way we, we use energy and design our buildings. Digitization, again, as I say, it's global, it's fast. Who would have thought um, 12 months ago that we'd be here delivering a webinar and using Zoom and WebEx and Teams to have our meetings and discussions and share knowledge? Uh, we have just discussed in this before we start this presentation. 12 months ago, we'd all be sat in a room, um, probably enjoying a sandwich and a, maybe a drink and a chat with colleagues. Uh, and we'd be up on a stage actually presenting this to you instead of doing it virtually. So that shows how quickly technology is changing the way we're doing business. Again, emerging technologies, global megatrends are colliding to disrupt both business and society. Uh, cloud computing, big data, internet of things, artificial intelligence, industry for BIM, e-commerce are all disrupting how we design and manage and use buildings. 
Sustainability, another key area, definition, process of state that we can maintain at a certain level for as long as wanted. And it's balancing those three balls there to make you know, the social, economic and environment to mean that the three spheres can operate without damaging the requirements of future generations to meet their own needs. And more and more, we need to take this into consideration in the way we design and operate and manage our built environment. Okay, so we talked about um, some of the drivers behind it and some of the, the key areas, but what's going to make this happen? Energy standards, technical memorandum, guides and certification. Okay, the standards, there are quite a few standards now out there as the IE6, IEC 60364-8-1 2019, low voltage electrical installations, uh, part 8.1, uh, functional aspects of energy efficiency. Again, this stipulates the requirements and measures and recommendations for the design, erection and verification of all types of low voltage of electrical installations including local production, storage of energy, optimization, and overall efficient use of electricity. Here in the UK, we've adopted the IEC standard and we've incorporated that into BS 7671, the 18th edition. And there is a new part eight, it's not currently published, but part eight will follow through from an energy efficiency point of view. Uh, and will probably mirror the 60364. And again, it will requirements the proposed new section meeting the requirements of part L of the building regulations, uh, which again, we talked about if it's, uh, it's min a minimum standard to which uh, we need to comply. Um, the other area is uh, BSC N15804, 2012 and A1 2013. And this gives guidance around core product category rules relating to environment, environmental product declarations or EPDs. Uh, it is envisaged that this is where the embodied carbon data for all construction products will be, be housed. So you would need to find everybody who manufactures um, you know, circuit breakers, switchboards, light fittings, their embodied carbon will need to be published onto their environmental product declaration or somewhere in, in that. Uh, part L of the building regs, again, that's currently under review uh, and they're looking for a, a switch of using CO2 as the primary power to, to measure building formants to a fabric first approach. So rather than looking to design in systems and things to improve efficiency and energy efficiency, is to look at the actual building from day one to improve insulation capabilities, to look at passive systems, and to actually design for energy efficiency right from concept. Okay, SIBC, uh, uh, Charlie Institute of Building Service Engineers, they have published a numerous documents and technical memorandum. Uh, okay, so I'm not going to go through every single one, but I'm assuming a lot of you will be familiar with these documents. Uh, it's the climate change for indoor environmental aspects, renewable energy sources, TM39 building energy metering, uh, TM40 health and well-being in building services. Um, and then you've also got um, RICS, the Royal Institute Chart Surveyors. They've got, done a calculation of embodied carbon materials for construction products. And then you've got the Department of Health and other large organisations producing their own technical memoranda. Some interesting ones here as well, which are new, is TM65, which will be published this year by SIBSI, and that's the standard method to evaluate embodied carbon of building services equipment. So, so that's all the things that we get involved with, your pumps, your hair handling units, switch gear and things, so they're actually looking about incoming your embodied carbon. Uh, Guide L for sustainability, which was produced, uh, published just last year. And then we have the health technical memorandum for health sector for the NHS facilities in England. That will be again published this, this year with the net zero very much at the forefront of the mind in their design guidance. Uh, the NHS uh, announcing that they're going to be uh, net zero by um, 2040. So 
Okay, so there's a lot of good information out there on, on helping you to put minimum design standards. Certification, well, I'll touch on the first two, uh, ISO 50001, um, which is a, a management system to, um, to define systems and processes to continue to improve energy performance. Uh, I would say this is particularly applicable to large organisations, big industrial users who want to demonstrate their energy efficiency uh, and their systems that they, they are managing it, but it also gives a good outline of all the minimum standards to require to make an energy management system. Uh, there's LEED is another one. Uh, again, this is an American um, environmental design accrediting body. It's uh, quite popular obviously in the States uh, and, and also in the, in the Middle Eastern countries as well. We're probably more familiar in the, in the UK with BRIAM, which is the building research establishment uh, and it is a way of independently verifying through assessment uh, what the BRIAM rating of a particular asset or life cycle is so so you stitch from BRIAM outstanding to excellent to good so so you can see by making that statement what level of declaration you're going to make for your building and again, let's say post that you've got the non-domestic energy performance certificates, which state what the indicates the energy efficiency of a building um, from an installed heating, ventilation, cooling, and lighting systems, uh, and an efficiency grade from A to G, A being the best, G being the worst. So these are the things that are driving the areas for improvement here. So, and then the drive to net zero. Net zero, what is it? Net zero is trying to balance your operational energy use with the energy supply that you're using to generate it, whether that's on site renewables or investment and off site in renewables. And there's a couple of definitions here which I'll, uh, I'll read out because it's quite interesting. I say one for the World Green Building Council a zero carbon building is an highly efficient building that produces on site or procures carbon-free renewable energy in an amount sufficient to offset the annual carbon emissions associated with the building operations. So basically, the energy that it's using is being sourced either from renewable sources on site, which we saw that right at the beginning of the presentation, that very complicated grid. I mean, we believe that the future it's not going to be a single source of energy supply. It's going to be numerous sources, whether that's going to be from the grid, whether it's going to be from a CHP, is it going to be from a district heating system? Is it wind powered? Is it battery powered? Is it solar powered? So, and, and managing all those different uh, resources or sources of energy into the building uh, to optimize efficiency is going to be key. And we'll touch upon again that later on in the presentation. Okay, UK government's definition of net zero is that the total UK's greenhouse gases, uh, which includes carbon dioxide, will equal to be equal to or less than the emissions of the UK removed from the environment. And this can be achieved by a combination of emission reduction and emission removal. So again, that's something we'll touch upon in the next couple of slides. Okay. Drivers for change, there's a nice picture of here of London uh, after a heavy rainstorm, but this could happen if sea levels rise and we, we don't do anything. So you've got the UN framework of convention on climate change, again, able to stabilize atmospheric concentration of greenhouse gases, with the Paris Agreement in December 2015, again, to try and set target temperatures uh, to well below two degrees C. Uh, America dipped out. They're now back in again under the new regime, which uh, can only be a good thing for the world. Um, EU Energy Performance, the Buildings Directive, uh, 2000 and 2018, has set a target of nearly zero buildings by January 2021. Obviously, that's passed. Um, you know, all, all very laudable, uh, but like with all these things, you've got to implement them. And then the UK government have adopted a net zero carbon target by 2050 requiring further reductions and targets initially set out in the Climate Change Act of 2008, which was driven from the European Energy Performance Directive. And then we have the World Green Building Council making a statement that all net new buildings should be net zero carbon by 2030 and all buildings by 2050. 
which is very interesting. And this is a quite a, a a very interesting little chart which looks at uh, current energy demand and current zero carbon energy supply and where it needs to be to get to net zero by 2050. Interesting thing about this little graph that we need to reduce our energy demand by 60%. So it's all right having the renewables, but we need to actually reduce energy. So we need to increase both the energy performance of our buildings uh, and the efficiency and optimise the energy that we do actually use. OK, so how do we get there? 2021, 10% new buildings will be net zero. 20%, 40% by 2022, 60% by 2023, 80% by 2024, and 100% by 2030. So by 2030, all new buildings will be zero carbon. That is one big task, but it's starting now, and I'll say we are, we are heavily involved with design consultants, and we're seeing a lot of this uh, new technology and new thoughts being, being pushed through into uh, designs that will be coming out over the next few years. Okay, and how do we get there? So looking at different current practice, using heat pumps, improving air tightness, all, all different things. So if we look back at what they were saying about uh, Partel, fabric first approach, look at more insulation, look at better properties, air tightness, better systems uh, and ultimately low energy design. So you design from day one to be a low energy building. Achieving net zero. Okay, there are the five there. So we've got uh, reducing construction impacts, zero carbon balance, low carbon supply, energy use, measurements and verification. The three areas that ABB have can influence on this is low carbon supply, low energy use, and measurement and verification. Now, a quick look at uh, some renewable sources. Again, we've got no acts uh, growing, so we've got no direct, but this is a table directly out of SIBSI TM38. So it looks at the different uh, technologies, what their cost effectiveness is and their local impacts to see which are the best ways to go forward. So it gives some examples of sustainable renewable energy sources for buildings. And I'll say if you want more details, they're there in TM38. Um, you've also got supplementary technologies, battery storage, uh, which is becoming the more energy storage, uh, thermal storage, Fuel cells and hydrogen production, I'm not going to go into too much into that, but hydrogen production, we believe, will make a significant uh, play in the drive towards net zero. Uh, inverters and synchronization, again, improving uh, efficiency and optimization of the electricity supply. Absorption coolant and carbon offsetting. Again, carbon offsetting is, is capturing the carbon at source or paying other organisations to capture the carbon for us, i.e. planting trees. So these are some of the technologies and things which will help us create a low zero environment. Low energy use, again, upgrade of all the entire building stock um, to make them reach net zero, raising the minimum energy efficiency standards for renting commercial properties, Clean growth strategy could build, produce six billion pounds in cost savings by 2030. Mandatory operational ratings again can su successfully reduce energy, and this has been demonstrated by the Neighbour Scheme in Australia. Uh, public disclosure of operational data for the commercial sector. Um, we'll touch upon that a bit more with digital twins. I mean, one of the key drivers for that is that you need to share the data, so you can actually compare areas, cities, buildings with each other to optimise energy performance. And then energy saving opportunity scheme, all it's available to mandate businesses in scope of ESOS to demonstrate they've acted on the energy saving opportunities identified. 
So there's lots of different areas that we can look to to improve energy efficiency and lower energy use. One of the key ones here then is, is measurement and verification, uh, and that is to ensure optimized energy use and comfort. Okay, so you've got comfort and energy insufficiency and sustainability and maintainability. And we're going to go into quite a bit of depth on this particular topic shortly. Okay, just to mention that we uh, practice what we preach at ABB. I mean, this is, uh, I don't think you'd see this uh, anywhere in the UK anytime soon, but this is the world's tallest wooden building. Uh, this is built in uh, in Sweden uh, at, uh, at Luxenshield. And, you know, it basically uses, a, it's a net zero building, so it's using very low carbon construction materials. And that's also then been improved by using the ABB ability system to optimize and reduce energy within that building. So, and again, we'll get into more, more detail with that. Okay, has anybody got any questions on the, uh, the first part of the presentation? Right, Nigel, Richard. Um, yes. The que yeah, the question come in just asking the uh, the point with the advent of EV cars and charging, it's pretty impossible to to get a reduction in electricity use um, over the time frame that we're looking at. You know, 2030, which I think is is a very valid point. Um, do, do you want to answer that, or shall I answer that one? Um, Any thoughts on that? I mean, the thoughts are, I mean, as I said, the 2030 target is for a net zero building. So, again, it's to say, I, I, I'm probably on the same page as the person who's made the comment about, I mean, EV is going to increase demand of, of for electricity, not reduce it. Um, but to make it net zero, they need to be able to bring in more sustainable electricity uh, to to, to to charge EV vehicles, but the 2030 statement is is for buildings, not necessarily for the full transportation network. Um, how are we going to achieve it in 2050 is a big question. Uh, you saw from my uh, little graph from the World Green Building Council, uh, which is you know there's a staggering reduction in energy requirements of 60%, uh, and then we're going to increase energy requirements with the use of EV vehicles. So that is a big Quandary. I don't know if you want to add anything to that, Richard. Well, I, I see a, a lot of organisations, and I think some of the statements in here talk about carbon. So I think the thinking is, I know if, if we take example the introduction of electric domestic boilers, that an electric domestic boiler produces less carbon than a gas boiler. So I think that's the thinking behind an EV car, that an EV car produces less carbon than a, a, a petrol or a diesel. For, providing vehicle. that the electricity that's powering that electric yeah. vehicle or that electric boiler is sustainably sourced. Yeah, yeah. So we're, we're talking about carbon reduction, yeah. aren't we? But yeah, yeah it, but it's that, is part, the, that is the balancing act is, is actually yeah. the carbon has got to mm. come from a sustainable renewable supply, not from fossil fuels. Yeah. Because yeah. if we continue to burn fossil fuels or using... Uh, fossil fuels to generate the energy in the first place, it's not zero carbon. Yeah, okay. Um, I can so jump in there. It is, it is a big challenge for, for the sector uh, yeah. to actually look at how we do this. So, um, as I say, I think this, this, this particular presentation raises more questions. I mean, from ABB's point of view, as I said, the, the, the main area that we can look at is optimization of the energy that we use. Um, as I say, we, we, we're not into generation uh, or trans transportation. We do the hardware and we can look at how you optimize that and balance that within the building. And again, from EV charging loads added onto the building, we can actually look at actually how we, we manage that again within the building. But that I'm not going to take say too much because I'm taking stuff away from Richard's part presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Nigel. Okay, so I'm going to hand you over to Richard. I hope, sorry, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, well, well, please continue to post your questions yeah. uh, or your comments on that. So okay. the next section, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how ABB hopefully can help reduce uh, electrical consumption, energy consumption, and overall its 
carbon consumption as well. So this is this slide we've tried to highlight here on the left hand side currently where we are in terms of energy production and we we focus in here on a centralized energy production scheme and Nigel highlighted earlier how inefficient this is with up to 60% associated losses in in centralized energy generation and production on the right hand side you can see where the where the future will be for for energy generation and consumption and we're looking here at a decentralized system so nigel touched on it earlier we're going to have multiple sources of generation from solar wind hydro we're going to have battery storage systems we've then got effectively microgrids which are going to control uh, the demand side and the supply side of that energy and then as we move over to the right hand side of the slide there you can see where we're going to be consuming that energy so we've got ev charging we're going to have smart appliances which can manage the demand in a better way and um, hopefully uh, a lot more balancing in, in these microgrids as well now as you can imagine when you move to these microgrids you Got a, you, the requirement is for a lot more control and command and control and monitoring of that energy use. So you can imagine things like the Internet of Things is, is going to there's big demand on that type of technology to control all of these systems. So if we zoom in on this, we're going to focus on, ele on the electrical side and, and where ABB sits in terms of low voltage electrical distribution. So there's three scenarios here. We've got the past, today, and where we'd like to be in the future. And we're focusing here on the, the main distribution, the sub-distribution, and the final distribution. And if we look at the past, Probably before building regulations uh, stipulated, there was very little monitoring of the electrical system. And uh, the part on the left hand side just shows us sort of points where we perhaps would have monitored uh, mainly, mainly at the LV uh, main switchboard there. In the middle today, we're doing a lot better. And I think uh, developments in standards have helped push uh, monitoring through, through this. So as you can see, main distribution which is the the pink color we're doing quite a good job on monitoring that system beneath that we've got the sub distribution which is in the yellow section and we've got some limited monitoring on that and at the very bottom we've got energy monitoring uh, perhaps at the final distribution and it's very basic at that level in the future which is on the right hand side there We'd like to see everything in pink where we're able to to effectively monitor almost every outgoing circuit. And when you look at that microgrid scenario and the decentralized energy, it's, it's really crucial that we get that in place to help us control and command that energy. And uh, as you can see, there's a little cloud symbol. So everything's going to be connected to everything as well. So there's some recommendations here under the IEC 60364-8-1. Uh, and it does stipulate some of the parameters to pull out in electrical systems at different levels. So I won't re <laughs> re read through everything of that. So as you can see at the, the, the pink area, which is the main distribution, we're trying to pick up a lot of electrical parameters there, pretty much everything that you can imagine that will uh, be experienced on the electrical network. Just below that, we've got basic power monitoring in the yellow section, and here we're looking at sub-distribution, and we're picking up a fair number of, of parameters there, uh, which still giving some, some, some good feedback. And at the final distribution there, we really only look at the active energy, i.e. your kilowatt hours and what the demand is there. So I think what's interesting is what, how can we do this? And I, I think this is quite surprising in that 
if you look at the, the bottom level, if we look at the gray section, which is the, the final distribution, you're probably familiar with lots of devices, meters. We, we, these have been around for, for 20, 20 or so years now. And uh, they're pretty much commonplace now on the, the final distribution. If you look at the very top level in the pink area, which is the main distribution, we're now able to offer intelligence and metering in devices that you wouldn't have traditionally have, have found this. So we're looking at air circuit breakers, we're looking at molded case breakers, we're looking at ATS units. So it's uh, it's quite amazing how technology has, has enabled us to put uh, intelligence into these devices. And then if we look at the, the yellow section here, you can even have intelligence today in fuse switches, for example. You can even monitor a meter few switches and there's some examples there of what uh, what ABB can provide for you there in, in that uh, in that metering and monitoring network so if we were to look at a greenfield installation or a new installation the on the left hand side here you can see a, a diagram of where we could include that equipment at the main distribution the sub distribution and the final distribution you see it's relatively easy today we can actually do the embedded meter in a lot of the circuit breakers and uh, air circuit breakers both at the main distribution and sub distribution at the final distribution we tend today still to use uh, traditional uh, energy meters although there are technologies now on the market uh, and abb has them that you can actually monitor very final circuits with sensor based and um, as you can see the red dotted line there we can integrate all that, integrate and collect all that data, typically through a Modbus network, which you can view locally, or you can send it to a cloud platform so you can analyze and collect the data. What's a little bit more challenging is when we look at brownfield installations or existing installations, and typically uh, this is actually a bigger demand for this in the UK because we have a lot of uh, his existing building stock. And it's a, it's a bit more complicated because the last thing you want to be doing is ripping out uh, existing equipment. So we tend to have to have solutions that can complement existing switchgear and, elect and existing electrical infrastructure. So in this instance, we've got, uh, as you can see at the main distribution and, and the, and the sub-distribution, we've got retrofitting metering devices, uh, potentially using sensor-based meters as well and sensor-based uh, reading reading uh, data collectors as well. We still collect the data in a similar way. If you look at the, the red dotted line there, we could uh, collect the data, show it on a local monitoring system or take it back to a cloud platform. So, um, and again, ABB uh, has, has numerous devices that can can help you achieve that uh, that solution. So as I touched on earlier, uh, today ABB's range with air circuit breakers is, is under the Emax 2 and the molded case is under TMAX XT. And we've got solutions up to about 6,300 6, amps. As you can see, the ver in terms of metering and monitoring, the, the very high accuracy, class one accuracy, according to the IEC standard, uh, even, even uh, 0 0.5 class accuracy. And we can look at other parameters such as harmonic analysis. And all these devices, are, as I've shown previously, can be connected back into an intelligent network, a BMS, a cloud-based system, or an energy management solution. What we can also do is look at some of, it's not just demand that we can look at, uh, energy demand. We can also have a look at the, the network quality with, uh, with, with, uh, with most of the devices on the system. So we can look at things such as harmonic analysis. We can look at uh, voltage spikes, interruptions, sag swells, and voltage imbalances, which um, again, you can analyze and, and help reduce your energy. Uh, consumption as well but unless you know that is happening on the network it's very hard as Nigel had pointed out earlier if you can't measure that data you can't do anything to correct it so this is like a final 
snapshot of, of what we can provide. On the, the right hand side and on the sub and final final distribution, we can monitor right down to, to single circuit breaker level. Uh, that data can be collected and displayed locally for, for your customers or, or for energy managers or clients to, to interrogate. Um, we then can integrate that into the main distribution level and as I've, as I've shown earlier, we've got devices like uh, air circuit breakers and uh, molder case that can have the metering uh, technology inbuilt and we can feed all of that back through gateways and uh, you can have it to a third party uh, web server or cloud service. ABB has a, a system called ABB Ability that you can um, view all this data on or we can send it to a BMS or a SCADA system. So it's a really flexible uh, system that can grow as, you, as, as the system grows. You can put as much or as little in as is required and uh, hopefully it then you can analyze the data to, to bring down that energy consumption. And ultimately it's the carbon that, we, that we're concerned about. Okay, um, is, uh, that's the end of my uh, section. Is, is there any uh, questions coming in? Um... Uh, there haven't been any further questions since the last right. um, pause we took for questions, but I understand that Luke, uh, you have a, a couple of questions for, for our, our guests from OBB. Yeah, thank you very much, Omar. Um, yeah, and the thanks, thanks, guys. What a, what a wonderful presentation! There's so so much information to take in there. Um, I was going to say, with uh, some of the offerings that you've got there, especially for the ABB ability um, integration, um, what sort of training uh, can ABB provide to any members that that would be interested? Nigel, are you? Um... Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, just, I mean, just uh, can... yeah, sorry. So, yeah, sorry, Richard. Um, yeah, I'll, 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 unless you want to answer that. Well, um, I, th I think, um, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got lots, we've, we've got a whole series of presentations that go more in depth into the product offerings. So those are available and we can uh, provide the information uh, at, with the, um, with the handout that associates this presentation. And we've also got product managers that can give in-depth training on specific products. And we've got uh, team members that can look at the overall scheme and give advice. So yeah, we've, we've, got, um, we've got lots of additional training that, that can be requested and support as well. Yeah, that, that, so that's, that's really good, good, really good to know. So, sorry, were you gonna add something there, Nigel? No, 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 you carry on. Uh, no, I was just going to say that that's really, really good to know because if, if members are looking to uh, take on board this uh, this technology as one of their offerings, uh, it's good to know that there's uh, yeah more uh, information that can be made available. Um, kind of leading on from that, if members did have any particular projects, um, how would they be able to engage with ABB and are you able to assist in, in designing, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll block to that one there, Luke. It's, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, we're more than happy for us to reach out to myself or Richard. Um, are you going to post our contact details uh, on the uh, your portal on the ECA? That's correct. Omar? Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah. so, we'll so be, please uh... contact us. We have a, have a team of uh, of guys who are covering the whole of the UK who can provide technical and design support to you. Um, so, and also field any questions on any of the product ranges. Uh, be it um, maybe viability solutions, um, circuit protective devices, uh, right the way from MV down to LV. So, um, so please feel free to contact us. Yeah, yeah. Fan, I think fan, you fan. are you going to wrap up the Nigel's just got a final few slides to present, haven't yep. you, Nigel? So yeah, okay. Uh, I'll hand back over one, to Nigel. One more question. Oh. To Go on then. Yep. Um, I mean, ABB is very well respected. It's clear that you're involved in, in many different aspects. Um, but do you actually publish your own inbuilt, embodied carbon? Right. OK, I'll, I'll take that one again. Um, okay. ABB are in the process. I mean, I mentioned that earlier on in the presentation that we believe the uh, 
embodied carbon data will be published in the environmental product declaration so every product will have a uh, EPD uh, and we expect to be able to issue each individual product or system um, will have a sort of like grams of carbon per kilogram of product um, mm. type, type scenario uh, and we're currently working on that and with the hope to have that published within the for all our products within the next 18 months two years. Fantastic that's really good to know. Okay, and uh, and just on that note, so I'll, I'll take over and just uh, finish off the uh, presentation. Again, if anybody's got any questions as we move on, uh, and we just have a quick look at uh, digital twins through ABB Ability. So, uh, what is a digital twin? Uh, a digital twin, you know, can help us by um, sort of like creating a sort of a digital version of of a real asset or or building. Uh, I mean, it was originally developed in uh, the aerospace market and the automotive market for actually modelling performance of uh, aeroplanes and motor cars, but it's now been adopted to uh, into into buildings. Uh, and again, what it can do, it can uh, energy and resource consumption can be known. Uh, it can look at predictive maintenance and asset management, uh, occupant comfort and enhancement, occupant energy use and space management. What if analysis is so you can look at uh, what you do if you uh, you know you change the occupancy levels. I mean, it's very pertinent at the moment. You know, uh, people are spending less time. Are you going to change the floor paint in an office block? And you can model that before it actually you actually do it within the twin and see what uh, what if scenarios. Uh, you can use it to evolve existing systems to improve and optimize their performance. Uh, closed loop design so you can then feed that information back into your next design for your next building or look at other buildings and to see how to optimize their performance uh, and then look at operational cost reduction. Uh, I mean one of the areas that um, we, we didn't touch upon uh, in, in Richard's presentation or we touched upon briefly is that all this embedded uh, technical data of our smart devices can not only give you your sort of energy requirements and energy meeting parameters, you can also look at physical parameters in terms of asset management. So from a circuit breaker, how many times it's been switched on and off, what look at the contact wear, uh, it can also report back on sort of smart sensors on motors and in fans, looking at bearing wear and stuff. And again, give you opportunity to, um, to improve efficiency by taking reactive action to, to to replace things or maintain them before the needs uh, it actually becomes detrimental to the efficiency of the building and that's all done by the, the smart devices and that applies across the whole range of ABB's products. So how does that link in, into a digital twin? Uh, again this is a, a nice little document courtesy of the uh, Institute of Electrical Engineers uh, and it shows a you know 3D model uh, or design that's been done in BIM. So you've got your product data, you've got how it's been constructed, you've got all your coordination, you've got all your product data sheets, so you know what's in your building. In the real building, you will also have lots of sensors and meter, meters started around the place, so you're looking at uh, your live systems, so you're actually getting real-time information from your building. Uh, and this is not only from an electrical point of view, but you can be looking at CO2, monitoring the building, humidity, natural light levels, occupancy levels, and that can all be fed back into an analytics. So you've got an integrated analytical system uh, and you can have potential machine learning to do, to, to start driving that. And that actually creates a digital version of your building. At the moment, it's not necessarily a one system that does everything, it's an e an ecosystem of digital twins. So your, your BMS, CMS system, you could say, is a digital twin of your electrical and mechanical systems. But it's not only reporting what's actually happening, it's actually then taking that information and using it to do better things with and do more with. As I mentioned before, you can look at it from a predictive maintenance point of view. You can look at operations and building the life cycle and do what if analysis so ultimately you can actually take your uh, your building and look at and say well it's not 
working, you've got the design criteria where you expected it to operate, and you can actually then look at how it should operate and actually how you can improve things. Uh, and as I mentioned right at the beginning, 36% of energy is used in unidentified applications. What could you do if you could identify those applications? You know, is that energy being used to its best use? Is it being wasted? You could do all that by pulling it through into a digital twin. And then ultimately, from that, you can link the digital twins. So you're taking all these parameters, putting it through an ABB ability or a, or, or a cloud-based system. So it enables you to look at uh, your energy, your assets, and security and comfort. And from your BIM models and your digital twins, so you take your BIM information, put it through artificial intelligence, you can develop your new buildings, and you can also then link buildings and systems together to look at their performance. And you're now moving towards smart cities. So not only have you got your, your building that is all connected and looked at in real time, you can actually model that in connection with its environmental impact within a city or a town. You can actually can compare its performance to a similar building or its twin building. And if you're an owner operator that's got numerous buildings, you can have the ABB Ability Cloud-based system and you can actually do direct comparisons on a direct pre-configured uh, um, dashboards and do direct compare, compare and contrasts of your buildings. So you can see which ones are performing better and which ones are performing worse and take actions to improve that performance. So again, with the ABB Ability System, it allows you to know more, to assess and measure. If you can't measure, you can't manage. Uh, you can do more, you can monitor, manage and control, you can do it better, you can start to optimise and predict and simulate and then together by linking all these different buildings together, whether it's in a portfolio for one developer or one estate owner or on a bigger scheme of a city or a town or even a country, we can start to manipulate and manage our data better and optimise and learn to improve and increase efficiency of our built environment. Uh, this is a typical dashboard from the ABB Ability. Uh, again, it's already straight out of the box, uh, ISO 50001 compliant. It gives you everything there to comply with all the standards. Uh, and again, these are all pre-configured dashboards. So there's no additional configuration to take place. So it's giving you real-time information of your, your energy system and also auditing your assets as well. So from a wear and tear point of view, so you can see in real time whether your breakers need to be serviced, maintained or they're due to fail. And you can also bring in other systems as well from your mechanical, heat, water, gas, mechanical plant. Uh, so you can look at the whole lot in one system. And then you can overlay that over building to building to building and compare and contrast. Uh, and just to say that ABB sort of practice what we preach. Again, ABB are pursuing a vision of uh, energy self-sufficiency and CO2 neutral industrial production in our buildings by 2030. Uh, again, we've got a roadmap to decarbonise all buildings within 2050 in line with the European Directive. Um, support a building renovation system to improve energy performance in our old buildings monitor energy performance and the support of rollouts of e-mobility and infrastructures. And ABB have already made the decision that they're going to fully electrify their fleet uh, within, within all their countries and areas of operation. So again, you know, EV is a, is a part of the solution. It is not the solution, but it's part of it. Uh, and this one, as you can see here, we've got a massive photovoltaic array, which was built on the car park or above the car parks. So you can see this little picture in the corner. So you've had the car parks and they've now sort of put roof over the car park and put photovoltaics on it. And this is at the ABB's Bush Jaeger factory in Ludenshed uh, and their vision to zero. Uh, and basically we created operational visibility 
uh, and we track carbon and we reduce CO2 emissions by 630 tonnes per year. Uh, optimise utilise its connected assets to forecast loads and on-site generation and that's reduced our energy costs by 4.2% uh, and participation in energy markets to increase revenues to 2 to 5% so that's because we can predict our energy usage we can actually participate in the energy markets as well so that so that's a demonstration of ABB trying to to become net zero and we're applying that to all our facilities across the globe okay so just a quick knowledge check uh, well before i go into that has anybody got any questions about what we've just discussed There's and nothing no further questions no. from the audience okay. at this point. So, so again, just a quick summary. We've looked at our energy use today. We've looked at global megatrends and assessment of energy efficiency standards. Uh, we've done an understanding of the factors driving the net zero carbon agenda. Uh, subsequent developments of energy management and verification technologies. Uh, and we've looked at uh, digital twins uh, and how the digital use can contribute to future design strategies. Uh, and I'd like just to finally say that you know, during the presentation, there are lots of resources out there for published by SIBC, IET, uh, British Standards, on how we can actually help and design and develop net zero buildings. Uh, so it's all there for everyone to see. Uh, and finally, if anybody's got any questions whatsoever, uh, please feel free to ask. Uh, I'll give you a minute or so. Thank you, yeah. Nigel, and, and okay. thanks, Richard, for, for your presentations. Um, so the resources that were mentioned uh, throughout today's session, uh, there will be a link to those in the description of, of the, uh, the video replay. So today's session was recorded and it will be posted on ECA's YouTube channel. That's at youtube.com forward slash ECA live. All the links and resources that we mentioned today will be uh, in the video description. So do be sure to keep an eye out for that. And um, those of you who are ECA members, uh, tomorrow you will be getting our fortnightly member newsletter, The Source, and uh, the replay of today's webinar will be included in that newsletter. Uh, so do uh, keep an eye on your inboxes for that as well. And uh, with that, I'd like to say a, a final thank you to Nigel and Richard from ABB for not just giving a a pretty perfect description of um, what net zero actually is in practical terms and, and you know but also for uh, describing how we can get there um, in, a, in a very pragmatic way and uh, you know outlining steps that the industry can take so thank you very much for that and uh, thank you also to Luke for joining us today and uh, final thanks to uh, everyone for watching and uh, have a great evening everyone Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.